and Jason Chapman as part of the International Firebird Conference 2007. In the second part of this topic, creating your first Firebird database, we'd like to offer a brief introduction to database objects, constraints and data types. Database objects. The number of objects in a database is unlimited. Let's take a quick look at the database objects Firebird has to offer. Domains are perhaps best described as user-defined data types. I can say, for example, that I have a customer number which is 10 characters long and always begins with a letter followed by digits. I can define the domain and the table fields support this domain. Domains offer minimal performance advantages as you can define multiple fields based on a single domain. And if you don't base your fields on domains, Fiber creates a domain for each field you specify. All domains can be found in the system table, RDB dollar fields. Tables. A table is a data storage object consisting of a two-dimensional matrix or grid of columns and rows, theoretically known as a mathematical relation. It is a fundamental element for data storage. The intersection of an individual row and column is a field containing a specific, indivisible atomic piece of information. That is, columns list the names of the individual fields and rows are the datasets containing the input data. Each database column may be assigned a different data type. Views are simply stored select statements. If I have a complex select, I can save it in a view and call it up whenever I wish. A lot of systems only allow the users to look at your data with views because you can change the underlying table structure and still present it in a consistent way in a view. Procedures are server-based operations that you can write yourself and store in the database as part of its metadata and they can be called by client applications. Triggers are basically the same as procedures, just that they fire automatically. A trigger lies on a table and is automatically fired when data manipulation occurs. The events causing the trigger to fire can be database, table, or row-based. Generators are global variables across the database, with which I can automatically generate sequential numbers. They are necessary because all operations in Firebird and Interbase are subject to transaction control. Firebird never allows a generator to generate the same number to two different users or transactions. And since Firebird 2, generators are now referred to as sequences. Exceptions are error messages for users, which you can incorporate into your procedures and triggers. UDFs are user-defined functions and offer extended functionality. They can be used when triggers and procedures aren't quite enough and you need extra functionality. You write them outside the engine and you can call them from inside the database. Rules are user groups. You can define groups with certain view and access rights for the database. Individual users are then assigned to the groups. Additionally, individual users can be assigned individual rights. It's much quicker and easier though to alter or extend rights for a single group than for all the users belonging to it. Indices can be compared to book indices, enabling rapid search capabilities. They are a sorted list of pointers into tables to speed data access. If the index field is unique, there is only one pointer. An index can be ascending or descending and can also be defined as unique if wished. A tip, you don't need to set an index just because of an order by. Order buys are so quick that an index will not bring much improvement. Indices are, however, useful when using WHERE conditions. IBExpert scripts. IBExpert has its own scripts language with which you can perform certain operations. For example, copy data from one database to another, which stored procedures can't do. Creating tables. 
Create table category, open bracket, ID, big int, not no, comma. Text, varchar 20. Character set, none, close bracket. This creates a table called category with two fields, ID and text. Then you should define the primary key. Alter table category, add primary key ID. You should define a primary key for every table. Without a primary key, you do not have 100% SQL access to the table. Without a primary key, you could insert two identical data sets, but when you use the delete command, only one of them would be deleted. And don't forget to simplify. Create a single column key on the ID field. If we take a look at the constraints page in IB Expert, on the left, you can see the primary key name on the ID field with index name and sorting direction. Foreign keys. Alter table product, add constraint, FK product, foreign key, category ID, references, category ID. In the product table, I can add a constraint that the category ID field in this table uses and references the ID field in the category table. Don't forget the simple rule. If there is a relationship between two tables, define a foreign key. Foreign key options. Here, there are certain conditions which I can specify what should happen if I alter a category. So, we've got a product and it's associated with a category action. What happens if we delete the category action? Suddenly, all the action products are invalid. So you need to specify a rule and the rule is defined by the foreign key. If you've got a value in there, it's got to be associated. So when we delete the category, we can either take no action, which basically says we're going to throw an exception. You could also cascade that delete. This means when you delete a category, all products belonging to this category will first be automatically deleted. The no action option would not allow this. Whilst cascade can be great sometimes, it can be extremely dangerous. By carefully selecting the constraint action, we can ensure database integrity. You can force uniqueness using the unique option for fields such as customer numbers, or in this case, DVD titles. Simply right click, select the field and commit. Now, you can't insert a new DVD with an already existing title. With the check option, you can add conditions. For example, here I need a value between 0 and 100, or the price should be between X and Y. You can define constraints for domains and fields. If you define a case such as the delivery date must be later than the order date, you have a table check constraint. Set null. If the category ID in product was allowed to be null, which is possible because it's valid for a foreign key to have null in it, it means it doesn't reference a value in that table. So if we set that to set null, then basically what's going to happen is it will go through all the products and change all the action IDs 1 to nulls, i.e. unknown. And the last one is set default. If we had a default value on the category ID, for example, default one, then it would set all deleted categories to one. Further indices. On the indices page, you can see active indices as opposed to inactive indices. You can also delete indices. If, for example, I set this index to inactive, the definition is still there, but it is no longer effective. Fiber does not allow you to inactivate system indices. Further data types. The following data types are available in SQL Dialect 3. Small int, from minus to plus 32,000. My tip is though, forget small int. A classical problem can be illustrated by the alteration of the German postal code system. Many databases used a small int for the four-digit postcodes as it only uses two bytes, but this caused problems when the German postcodes were extended to five digits. This also doesn't allow for European postcodes, which are generally larger, many of them also consisting of a letter-digit combination. 
An integer is from minus 2 billion to plus 2 billion. It uses 4 bytes. Big int uses 64 bytes for extremely large numbers. From minus 2 to the power of 63 to plus 2 to the power of 63. Float stores values with up to seven significant decimals. This can unfortunately sometimes be inaccurate, so I would not recommend using this data type. For example, if you have a million numbers and they should all add up to zero, you add them all up and the result is one cent. And if you then went through the calculator and added all those numbers up, there'd be a zero balance. So unfortunately, it's an imprecise way of storing numbers. For decimal precision, double precision is better. Double precision is for technical values, measurements and similar. It stores numbers with up to 15 significant decimals. The difference between numeric and double precision can be illustrated by the following simple example. You cut a cake into three equal slices. Each slice is one third of the whole, i.e. 0.3333, etc. And if you put the slices back together, you have a whole cake again, i.e. 100%. That is the technical viewpoint. From a commercial viewpoint, you cut a cake into three equal slices. The cake costs $100, and each slice costs $33.33. .33. So the sum of the three slices is therefore $99.99. Numeric and decimal are defined by the total length. For example, numeric 18 is a whole number value with a maximum of 18 digits. Numeric 18,2 means there are 18 digits altogether, so of these are decimal places. This is ideal for commercial applications, as you would get your cake sales total of $99.99 .99 and not $100. The date field uses four bytes. Valid dates are from January the 1st, 100 AD, through February 28th, 32,767 AD. For arithmetic purposes, day zero is November the 17th, 1898. Time is an SQL dialect 3 data type. 0.5 means midday at 12 noon and 0.25 means early morning at 6 a.m. Timestamp is a combination of date and time including leap years. When you query the value between two timestamps, the result is in days. When working with date and time values, there are certain commands called extract. For example, you can say extract day from date field. You can then define individual values. This is extremely useful if you need to group monthly values. A char or character field physically has the number of bytes it was defined with. Theoretically, any spaces not filled with text are filled with spacebar spaces. Practically though, the spaces are not physically stored in the database. The empty spaces are, however, returned by select queries. Varchar has a sort of trim function, so that any trailing spaces are not stored in the database. Block fields contain unstructured data. With a varchar, you have to say how wide the field is going to be. If you want to store a freely sized memo or video or graphic files, you put them into a blob. These act slightly differently within the database, so you need to think about them before you assign them. So, that was our introduction to creating a fiber database. A transcript of this tutorial can be downloaded by all IB Expert registered full version holders from the customer download area at www.ibexpert.com. All topics presented here are also documented in detail on our website. We hope this tutorial has been of help to you and look forward to publishing our next subject, Programming the Firebird Server. Goodbye for now and thank you from all of us at IB Expert.